Hi, and welcome to Sage for H, and welcome to the IR Theory interview series. In this interview series, we interview IR scholars about their preferred theoretical perspectives. The idea is to get a brief account of why scholars have come to appreciate a certain IR theory through a short interview. Today, I have the honor to interview another great scholar, namely Randall Sweller. He's a well-known realist and regarded as one of the top scholars in the field. Professor Sweller has made a number of theoretical contributions and focuses on great power politics and grand strategy. He's the author of three books and has published numerous articles in leading journals, including a defense of Trump's foreign policy. His most recent book is Maxwell's Demon and the Golden Apple, Global Discord in the New Millennium. Welcome, Professor Sweller. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. It's really nice to have you here today. So before we start and jump into the realist concepts, could you please tell us a little bit about your scholarly background? Uh, I got my PhD from Columbia University in 1993. Uh, I was a Robert Jervis, Jack Snyder, Dick Betts, <laughs> big now Brzezinski type student. And uh, in the 80s, there was a lot going on at Columbia. So uh, as much as we had professors, we also had really good people, the students. So I, I think of my, my education as including Tom Christensen mm -hmm. and uh, John Mercer and Ted Hoff and people like that. Uh, it was just a who's who, really. And um, if we say my background, uh, sort of a, a realist slash psychology background mm -hmm. in international relations. I, I, I did a lot of psychology as a uh, political psychology as a grad student. Uh, I also was influenced by uh, Debbie Larson. Deborah Larson was at Columbia at the time and Fritz Craddockville and uh, Gerard uh, Ruggie. So it's quite a bunch. Uh, sure. Yeah, and so that's my sort of, then I went to Harvard for a year, which is very mm -hmm. instructive because uh, I was an Olin fellow at Harvard in 93, 94, and I met uh, Sam Huntington and mm -hmm. Steve Rosen and uh, Mike Desch. There was a lot of people brought, coming through. Uh, that it was, it was uh, one of these great programs, actually. The Olin fellows at um, Harvard, where most people in security got their card punched, you know, at least for a year. And uh, that, that was a very formative part of my career. I don't think intellectually so much. It's just the idea of meeting people um, in the field and getting, getting to know people. I think that's one of the great things about the field of international security is that we're a pretty tight bunch. Like yeah, we see yeah, each yeah. other all the time. It's like, you know, John Mearsheimer. I mean, I've spent so much time with John Mearsheimer in airports and yeah. Talking with him, I feel like he's a friend, and yet I never had a course with them. Yeah. I never. I just we just have gone to so many different conferences together yeah. uh, since you know 1986, seven, mm -hmm. eight. You know uh, that you know it's a it's a really good bunch of people, really good bunch of people. Like the best people are in international <laughs> security. They're real. They're really good. At it. Yeah, that's really nice. That's really nice. Uh, uh, when you since you since you mentioned it, uh, going to conferences and you mentioned Mearsheimer, I remember my first memory of a conference was actually in the at the ESA conference in Toronto, 2014, mm. where Mearsheimer and his colleagues I don't remember who the colleagues were actually, but Mearsheimer claimed to have uh, put the last nail in the coffin of uh, democratic peace theory. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and there uh, and the. Uh, I think I you got stayed at Eikenberry, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Well, they were like five, six person there, and they claimed that they had now definite proof. Uh, they have nailed the last, uh, they put the last nail in the coffin of democratic peace theory and really uh, debunked and uh, falsified the theory. And if I remember correctly, there was one guy there that really got up there and, and, um, and was quite shocked. He, he, he agreed with many of the claims, but he was still uh, a bit shocked about, I mean, the audacity to say that you have put the last nail in the coffin of democratic <laughs> peace theory. And, and just when it comes to my mind, wasn't that you? 
Uh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I had created a Democratic piece. My first articles in world politics in 92 was almost like a defense of Democratic peace theory, actually. I was yeah. saying that democracies don't uh, wage preventive wars. Uh, it's a good piece, actually. It was uh, something about a, a, a preventive war and uh, domestic structure and preventive war, democracy is more specific. But I'm not a democratic peace yeah. at all. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I totally okay. agree with Mearsheimer. But no, yeah. I would never say it's a Mearsheimer. Yeah. I just do them. What I like about John and what it sounds like what you're conveying is his yeah. audacity. Yeah. Like, you know, it's a good thing to, yeah. um, he's from that old group of scholars that I learned from, which I yeah. have to say, very, very different bunch. They were, um, uh, if you've ever seen the paper chase, they, they captures from 1971 or whatever, it captures this group of quirky individuals who are not entirely socially uh, with it. Um, yeah. But that's what's interesting about them. And they make waves, they make big statements, and they're not boring. They're not mm -hmm. slick. They're no, not no. corporate. Mm -hmm. There's nothing corporate about them. No. And I think today's scholars are much more corporate mm -hmm. and they sound, I'm, I guess I'm one of them, you know, all these stories about me, mm -hmm. but I, I was a musician for many years. I still mm -hmm. am. I'm a guitar player mm -hmm. first and foremost. And, um, uh, I was in a Grateful Dead band. I was Jerry Garcia for many years <laughs> in New York and New Jersey. Uh, and, um, uh, and actually, one of my band members joined the Grateful Dead, uh, Rob Barocco. So, uh, you know, we, we were very close to that. But I always saw the field as more entertain. you know, not that it's entertainment. Mm -hmm. That's it. But you should be entertaining. Mm -hmm. And, and you've got to say, John Mearsheimer is not only the hardest working person in IR show business, yeah. but he's a showman. Yeah. And I think there's something to be said. I, I know... Um, for for young scholars that uh, the way to put it the way i like to put it but you have to understand what i'm saying is yeah. you need a good rap mm -hmm. like you know rap mm -hmm. like a rappy rap mm -hmm. like john mirashima has that whenever yeah, yeah, he yeah. gets up to give a talk mm -hmm. he has something to say and he's going to convey what he has to say and he's going to yeah. be very definite about it. he's not wishy-washy no, no, never no. miss the point yeah, he's and straightforward and clear yeah, and I'm and I'm telling you, like uh, Mansur Olson was a master at this. If you ever saw Mansur Olson collective action problem, guy could use he could take his theory on collective action mm. and make it tell you a story about anything. Like you know, he did state formation, everything. But it wasn't just that he had a great theory that he could use for all kinds of things because it was powerful, which is the idea of theories. They should be powerful, yeah. explain a lot with a little. But yeah. boy, that guy could give a talk. He was like the mad. Mm -hmm. It was like the Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. He would get up there and have a voice you couldn't forget. And mm -hmm. it was like he was like a magician. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's something to be said for presentation and, yeah. you know, argument. But, but, at, but at the same time, it's much easier to have that approach when you have a parsimonious theory. Yeah. You try to say as much as possible with as little as possible. But you if, hit it yeah, right if, on if, the head. The I mean, then it's quite the easy to have that approach. But if you have an eclectic theory, empirically rich, or you know, complex, you you hit the nail on the head. That yeah. is exactly that's the take home point. Yeah, is that people like Mansur Olson and John Mearsheimer like theory to simplify, not complexify. And if you're simplifying mm. reality, you're going to have a nice, neat story. Mm. It may not work. It may, you may, you could say it's wrong, but mm. at least you'll remember it. it mm. You know, the idea of the bumper sticker, you mm -hmm. need a, some kind of bumper sticker take home point. And I find that that's what's so sorely missing at conferences. Yeah, yeah. Uh, most talks that I see, they just they're, you know, they're making life way more complicated than it needs to be. And it certainly doesn't make for an exciting talk. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Waltz also said the same thing, right? He, he emphasized that the theory is constructing a reality, but it's not the reality. Absolutely. That, and that theory should simplify reality, not make it more complex. I just wrote a conclusion, a chapter for a special issue in uh, security studies on the 100th birthday of Ken Waltz. So it's a tribute issue. We hope will get published as a special issue in in um, uh, security studies. 
mm. uh, on Ken Waltz, and I wrote the conclusion. That's one of the things I'm saying. It mm. explain a lot with a little. His whole point is my theory doesn't explain a lot. It just tells you a few important things. Mm -hmm. and a few important things, it tells you a lot. There's mm -hmm. actually a lot more there. Mm -hmm. But what if you wanted, you could just talk about it very simply. Mm -hmm. uh, and and explain a lot with a little. It's mm -hmm. E equals M C squared. That's the point. Yeah, Parsimony, yeah. power. Yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. we want. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. All right. So uh, let's get back to business. Um, uh, but nice uh, little intercession there. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you were to choose three core realist concepts, uh, which ones would you choose and why? Yeah, I think. The reason I like realism are, are three, you know, at least at least three. But these are the most important. Most important to me, and it goes with the conversation we just had, is that it's about power and influence. And to me, that's the core of politics. If you're a political scientist, always remember you're here to talk about politics. And then what is politics? Well, I know people have various definitions, but I still go back to Harold Laswell's definitive to me definition, which is politics about who gets what, when, where, and with what consequences. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about power is about influencing others. It's about getting your way. And to me, you know, realism puts power front and center. And so that's just another way of saying realism puts politics front and center. I can't tell you how many times I've read dissertations or proposals and I'm like, where's the politics? You know, I, I mean, it's fine, but where's the politics? And, you know, so realism always remembers what we're doing and understands that the world really is driven so much by power and influence. Second, and these are all related, obviously. Um, I think this one is the one I, I wish realists would talk more about. I've been saying this all my career, scarcity, and competition over scarce resources. Mm -hmm. I think re realism is, is about material and social scarcity. And sometimes, uh, uh, and we were talking about Mearsheimer and Waltz, I think mm -hmm. sometimes they talk too much about security per se. Mm -hmm. And I think security is interesting. I mean, it's a very important part of realism, mm -hmm. but security to me is not necessarily about positional competition mm -hmm. i in other words i don't think security is always scarce and i don't think it's something that can't be shared by all i think mm -hmm. we can all be secure at the same time mm -hmm. for example if we all put big locks on our doors or if we all had a, a, a panic room well, mm -hmm. we could all be secure, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they say, well, states can't do that. Yeah, they actually can. Mm -hmm. uh, th there are times when security can be shared by all, but, but material goods are scarce mm -hmm. and social goods are scarce, like social scarcity. And here, I mean, we can't all be the leader. We can't all have prestige. We can't all... Uh, be the most intelligent or whatever, you know, that's social scarcity. The reason we go to universities these days, the reason everyone needs a university degree is social scarcity. That today a degree is worth less than it was a hundred years ago. And that's because we're all running faster to stay in place. That's positional competition. That, that's about scarcity. That, that is a material resources. We can't all drive uh you know big tank type cars you know we can't all do that uh it's good to be number one because in a world of material social scarcity you get everything it's not fair that's another thing about realism i like it's that it recognizes the most important thing about life and i i'm saying this as life the most important thing every student that watches this better figure out now <laughs> is that life isn't fair. <laughs> I tell you, Jonathan Kirshner told me this one. Jonathan Kirshner told me this, and he was so right. I, I have. I went, he said, "Well, I know you've heard it, but you don't really understand it. You're not really, uh, you know, feeling it." Mm -hmm. I said, okay, so I thought about life isn't fair. Mm -hmm. Well, that's realism. Real life isn't fair. Um, the powerful get more. You know, it's the old: the powerful do what they will, and the weak suffer what they must. 
That's life. And, and so you want to be the most powerful in a world of scarcity, scarce material and social goods. Okay, so that's the second thing. And the third thing about realism that I like is um, self Well, you know, if we take look at the world today, realism would say globalism, interdependence, uh, it's not a good thing. For realists, states don't want to be interdependent. They want to be self-sufficient. They want to be as autonomous as they can be in a dangerous and uncertain world, in a very competitive self-help world. And I, I think that's, you know, that, that's a very important difference between realism and most of the foreign policy establishment, particularly the ones that go to Davos, those types, mm -hmm. the globalists, the borderless world types, mm -hmm. like... Um, you know, like Hillary Clinton in Oregon, you know, she said once, you know, we're not entering a multipolar world, we're entering a multi-partner world. Mm -hmm. and, you know, for people wow. like her, for mm -hmm. people like Bill Gates, the world is certainly global. Globalization works wonderfully for them. They don't have borders. Mm -hmm. But for most of us, there's borders. Mm -hmm. And so this idea is, you know, international politics is too serious a business to be interdependent. We don't want to be interdependent. We want them to be more dependent on us than we are dependent on them. Mm -hmm. When COVID struck, we saw great examples. We didn't have ventilators or masks. They were made in China. You know, mm -hmm. it was like penicillin made in China. It was like, why? Who allowed that to happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, power, uh, scarcity, and mm -hmm. um, autonomy. Yeah. Yeah. That I think... The, 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 the part about scarce resources and scarcity, I mean, you outlined that really nice in that uh, ontology, unipolar politics. You had a chapter there yes. uh, where you wrote you are, about... You uh, yeah, no, that one I actually read, actually. Uh, and um, uh, it was some time ago now, but I really liked that chapter. And it That's was about, the one I had in mind, but I did not think anyone... I mean, yeah. some, some people read it and say, wow, it's better than I thought, you know, but I, I put it in a volume at that time, just talking about careers, which your students might think is interesting. Yeah. It was like 1995 and I had mm. just, I was like a year out, but mm. I was doing a lot of edited volumes of people like Bob Cohane, Bob Jervis, Ken Waltz. If you look who's in that, that, that volume for yeah, yeah. yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an awesome volume, actually. Yeah, and, and I was doing one after another. The Elmans were doing that. And so I was putting really good work. I felt like I'm not going to be the weak link, this young, you know, young hey. guy, you know, at the table. I want to do good work. And so I was doing a lot of good work in, in, um, in these uh, edited volumes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they weren't throwaways back then. That was yeah. good. So I, I'm shocked and pleased that you knew what I was talking about. And I said, yeah, yeah. What was the title again? Uh, competition it, was great opposition power. it was something about the great powers, realism and the great powers, something about. Um, I said positional goods, something. Yeah, right? positional goods, something about positional competition. Yeah, yeah. Positional competition, yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that act, that is actually one of the chapters that made me really, really like realism. Because in Sweden, okay. you grow up as. A constructivist in some sense. I mean, oh, really? I was, I had, um, I mean, I was, even though I was very ignorant, uh, both as a master student and a PhD student, I must say, and I had some uh, really important encounters throughout my, uh, throughout my uh, PhD and uh, uh, also during the master's where I was really disciplined and it really taught me a lot, uh, where, where people actually told me that you really have to in some sense, uh, be able to write a better story in terms of going back mm -hmm. to the story part here. So, um, but I never abandoned realism, mm -hmm. but I, I, I had this commonsensical understanding of realism. This is, realism is the best theory because it's of course the best theory, but I couldn't really defend myself. And I was constructivists, post-structuralists, liberals, they were quite good at critiquing my claims. Um, but when I read that chapter, it was a, wow, this is how I've been thinking about it, actually. Oh, okay. uh, and uh, it actually changed a lot uh, in my thinking. That's, that's a very important chapter for me, actually. Well, my, uh, you yeah. know, my colleague is Alex Wentz, my yeah. colleague, and he used to always say I was a constructivist, which I'm not, but he was a constructivist realist. 
But uh, I always like to say some of my best friends are constructivists. So yeah. you know, I, I yeah. tolerate, you know, it's a big field. We can all exist. They're yeah. wrong, but you know. Yeah, can. yeah, yeah, no, I, I like that. And then, but the thing is you say power and because power is really the core of politics. Yeah. Um, and that is characteristic of realism, a core concept of realism. I don't think anybody would disagree really that power is the core of politics, but they might have other understandings and views about power, right? And how would that be? I, that's true. Uh, I think they water down. Like, another way, like politics could be defined as social relations with power, you know, uh, um, but then yeah, but, but I, you have I, other I, concepts. You have productive power. Uh, you have structural powers. The Susan Strange type of power, which is of course very yeah. realistic in some sense, I would say. Yeah, so I, I'm yeah. nothing against that. But you have um, uh, other types of power, right? That are not necessarily realist. That are more ideational in right. that sense. Yes. Discursive. Yeah. 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 That's all right. Absolutely. Mm. And um, you know, it's nice to have a big field where we can all discuss it. And I, I have nothing wrong. I certainly would never. Uh, Gain say things like discursive power mm -hmm. or even soft power. It's mm -hmm. fine. I mean, I can understand cultural power. I can see, um, yeah, there are lots of forms of power. Power is just a way to influence others. There are mm -hmm. lots of ways to do that. Uh, Susan Strange, I was just reading that book from my mm -hmm. Waltz chapter. Waltz mm -hmm. agrees with her. It's not yeah. much of a critique. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. No, he, no, like I, I really like the concept power. of structural power, actually. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, uh, let's continue. So um, thank you for those three concepts, power, yeah. scarcity, and autonomy, or competition yeah. over uh, or for persistent of goods, yeah. and so on. Um, so, uh, but those three, uh, very good. And then um, you have claimed um, that polarity has become less meaningful. What do you mean? Well, when unipolarity began, mm -hmm. it took me, you know, we were thinking in the field, I remember we would have, like, we just mentioned unipolar politics, the perfect segue. Yeah. We, we were having conferences about what does this mean? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we had a volume uh, unipolar politics where we had very good people talk about what does unipolarity mean as a structural form? What, what, what will its consequences be? Mm -hmm. And then we had meetings at the uh, at Georgetown where we started um, talking about unipolarity uh, with Eikenberry, uh, John Eikenberry, Bob Jervis, myself, uh, Jack Snyder, and uh, Steve Wall, people like that. Mm -hmm. uh, that became the National Intelligence Committee meetings, our council meetings, uh, that we've done for 25 years now. So anyway, uh, when I said that I think polarity isn't as meaningful anymore, I think my thoughts on it when I would think about polarity was, uh, well, um, in a unipolar system, the unipole is unconstrained. And this is a typical Waltzian reading that unchecked power should, needs to be balanced. Nature abhors unchecked power. Um, and uh, so he kept thinking that the unipole would be balanced. But as time went on, uh, it didn't seem like this was happening. But he, so there he was wrong. But wh what's going on? Well. It's because I say that polarity is not as meaningful because it doesn't constrain the superpower or the unipole. So mm -hmm. the unipole is pretty much free to do whatever it wants. Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking at what um, the behavior of the unipole in a unipolar system, you're better off looking at domestic politics of the unipole and the psychology of the leaders to get a kind of read on predictions and explanations mm. of what's going on because mm. structure isn't going to constrain it. So it can do any foolish thing at once. Walt said it would overextend. And mm. yes, that, that, that seems to be one thing we can say about a unipolar system that is true is that the unipolar power, because its power is unchecked, will tend to be reckless, will tend to exercise its power in a more capricious and reckless way. And we saw that with the extension of NATO, and we're feeling the prop, you know, the, the pain of that today. Uh, this enlargement of NATO to Russia's border, um, promotion of democracy all over the world, the Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, the world, we're going to democratize the Middle East. So we had all these grandiose ambitions about how we're going to turn the entire world into an American 
Christ-centric, uh, American-friendly world where everyone's going to be an American and love America. And we had these foolish ideas, and we got into these endless wars. And so the overextension of Unipol is one thing. Okay, we can predict that. But I, I don't think it's not necessary. I mean, unipolarity, allow, it, it's a what we call a permissive condition of very reckless foreign policy. It doesn't say it's going to happen, but it's permissive of this behavior. And we'll also talk about overextension. But what I think the other part that I don't think people realize as much, and I made a point of this when I was talking about why I didn't think polarity in a unipolar world mattered very much, is because not only is hegemon relatively unconstrained, but so is everyone else. Because the hegemon, there is no other enemy like the Soviet Union. If you think about how much power the US could wield in a bipolar world because others were threatened by the Soviet Union. So there was this other pole. And so the U.S. had that bargaining leverage. You want security, you want free markets, you want all this. We'll trade you security for, you know, supporting us on free trade and supporting us on here and all these things. Mm -hmm. But now those states and in the third world, they were playing a lot of power games back and forth using one, playing one superpower off the other. When that ended, it was like everyone for themselves. And the U.S. didn't have the leverage that it used to have in a, in a bipolar world, in the Cold War, to get others to do things they otherwise wouldn't do, to exercise power. So it wasn't just that the U.S. was unconstrained in a unipolar world, but so was everyone else, pretty much. And you can't be much of a leader if you turn around, nobody's following. You know, you need followers if you're going to be a leader. So, um, so that's why I was saying I didn't think polarity mattered as much. I thought regional polarity, regional politics mattered more. Um, so it was like a chandelier. If we were thinking of balance of power in a unipolar system, it would be more like a chandelier with lots of regional balances of power and regional things going on. But the center of action was not the global power thing. Now, I could be wrong, but that was my reasoning that I just didn't think the polarity polarity constrained any of the actors anymore. Yeah, interesting. Uh, but that's changing now. So, 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 now the world's becoming yeah. more bipolar. Yeah. Wow, have we seen a change? Notice how now everyone's talking about the return of great power competition and mm. all this. Mm. So I think we're starting to see the beginning of a, a bipolar system and uh, is emerging. I don't think multipolar is emerging, not yet. Mm -hmm. I think India would be the next poll, not Russia. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but mm. we are starting, you know, when I wrote that, it was unipolarity as far as the eye could see. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, this is this is what the, the National Intelligence Council here, we were talking about uh, in, the, in the early 2000s and, uh, you know, um, things turned around quickly with China. And then, you know, the financial crisis sort of changed everything, I think. The 2007, 2008 financial crisis, that's when everyone started thinking, ah, even this government, the US government started changing its assessments of the future from unipolarity and globalization as far as the eye could see to, oh, now we have China's rising and US is declining and mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah, but wasn't that just a narrative though? Yeah. And yeah. perhaps not so true in if we look at the uh, economic power of the major corporations in the world and the US dominance in terms of of uh, global TNCs um, and the, the market share and the market capitalization of US corporations. And I mean, Sean Stars, I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but Sean Stars makes that claim that uh, uh, the United States didn't decline, it's power globalized. And if you look at the top uh, 2000 companies in the world across 25 sectors, US corporations are the number one in terms of profit share in 18 out of those 25 sectors. And it's not no small dominance, it's not the 15% here, 10% there, and then the rest of the players is evenly spread out throughout the world. It's like 60% domination in terms of global profits, 70% uh, in terms of global profits, 55 yeah. and so on, up to 84% of the global yeah. profits generated within one single sector. How uh, you guys send me that? 
Well, yeah, yeah. The, 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 I was telling you the Walt's conclusion chapter yeah. I just finished. Yeah. Uh, it's a draft. It's, mm. it's, a, it's a good draft. But one of the points, I'm glad you raised this, is that I make the point that everyone is already declaring bipolarity. And I'm like, uh, not yet. Yeah. Not then you, then you, you, you definitely need to read uh, okay. uh, Sean Starr's paper because it's also a response to Christopher Lane's article a year before about mm -hmm. the end of Pax Americana. Oh, okay. uh, where yeah. he makes the case that, uh, well, you have to look at uh, the uh, globalization of U.S. capital. I, I do think China's coming. Like, I'm in the middle. Like, mm. I, I, I say in this piece that mm. I, I think there's been a rush to assert bipolarity. It hasn't happened yet. And that the U.S. is still the dominant power in almost every category. Mm. Uh, but but I, I think, you know, now lately, mm. Xi Jinping looks like he's slipping quite a bit. And uh, he is their number one problem right now, China's problem in terms of growth. And yeah. they have a lot of debt, and they have a very bad problem with their with their uh, worker to retiree ratio because yeah, of yeah, yeah. the um, you know, demographic problem policy. Yeah, so yeah. so China has a lot of problems. That's what I say. And people <laughs> don't want to look at all the problems. But that said. They they have a lot going for them in terms of uh, technology and artificial intelligence and uh, quantum computing and uh, you know I would not count them out. I mean they are a full array competitor now. Yeah. That's the difference. Okay. They're not they're not just a competitor. They're a competitor in every sector. So I, I agree with you. I'm glad you said that because I think too many Americans are just they see a threat. It was like Japan in the 80s. I remember mm -hmm. telling people. Uh, in the late 80s, my gosh, you're so worried about Japan and look mm. what happened to them. Mm. You mm. know, if you go back and look at the cover of Paul Kennedy's Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, which became like a coffee table book, yeah. would have yeah. guessed. he never would have guessed. Mm. And the cover was a Japanese planting the flag on the globe for the mm. 21st century. Well, mm. that's a little premature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was. Uh, but and uh, speaking of Sean Stars again, I think uh, he would publish his book now in 2022, where he's updating that argument from 2013. Yeah. Well, so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Take a close but, look at it. Yeah, I, I, I will send it to you. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a very nice uh, article actually. It also changed my mind about U.S. power, and it's also changed my mind about uh, looking at this in terms of state entities and having a more having a better focus or focusing more at least on, on corporate power. Well, I got to say, Chinese companies are falling right and left. If you look at the, the stock exchange in, the, in yeah. America, these companies have fallen off the cliff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every one of them, uh, yeah. because they're so worried about what China is doing to its own corporations. They are just yeah. killing them. Mm, so. Yeah, and then and that perhaps leads us in some sense to the next question, um, uh, because one of the uh, Trump administration's um, this, at least a desire they had was to repatriate uh, supply chains, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and you wrote an interesting article. Uh, I think what was it in foreign affairs or foreign policy? Yeah, there's foreign a couple coming foreign, out, this, yeah. uh, and there's uh, one coming out um, in a new edited volume by Robert. Bob Jervis, before he died, he edited this volume. Uh, and there's uh, one in uh, published in a previous version of that. So there's going to be like there's a second volume of one that already came out about mm. world uh, disorder. Yeah, no, but Anyhow, I, was, yeah, I, yeah, I, I was thinking. Yeah, but I was thinking more about this article you wrote where you. Uh, foreign affairs, three cheers for. Uh, yeah, Trump's a, de a defense. Policy. Yeah, a defense of yeah. Trump's foreign policy. Yeah, I, I've article. wrote like several things. I've got a yeah. new, you know, new updated mm. versions of it. That mm -hmm. I think are better. That mm -hmm. you know, they, foreign affairs in, in a way, uh, they're very liberal at foreign affairs, and mm -hmm. uh, they they. It's funny. Uh, let me. Uh, there's a story behind that Trump article. So yeah. I published a, an article uh, that was eventually called uh, Three Cheers for Trump's Foreign Policy." Yeah. And uh, believe me, they held their noses. They hired me to do it because okay. they knew I was like the only Trump supporter practically in the american academy yeah, and yeah. they had never had one good word on trump not yeah. a single good thing to say about him yeah. and so they said well that's not fair maybe <laughs> you have one article that says something good and so i was the token yeah, okay. trump article. Okay. and you know they but, were but, so proud of themselves yeah, for publishing yeah. that article yeah. i'm like 
the man brought us peace and prosperity. <laughs> what you know? Why are you so like shocked that somebody yeah. would say something good about him? It, yeah. it, it, it shocks me that this is probably good for your students. The liberal slant in this academy has shocked me since Trump. As bad as I knew it was, I mm -hmm. was just floored by how little ver debate and, and uh, breadth there mm -hmm. is in the academy when it comes to politics. Just to give you an example, I'm from Ohio State University. Ohio voted twice for Trump. I'm the only professor at Ohio 